Welcome to your commercial-free, uninterrupted investment show, sponsored by the SEC-registered investment firm, Wilsey Asset Management, a fiduciary firm owned and operated by President Brent Wilsey, who has been putting clients' investment needs first for over 40 years. The Smart Investing Show has been giving unbiased financial information for over 27 years on local radio stations right here in San Diego, providing you with fundamental analysis on stocks and investments you want to know about. Now, here are your hosts, Brent and Chase Woolsey. Well, hello and welcome to Smart Investing Show. I'm Brent Wilsey, president of Wilsey Asset Management. Great to have you here with us today on the Smart Investing Show. And uh, also, too, we're the proud uh, investing partners of the San Diego Padres. Uh, very proud about that, uh, to be part of the Padres. And uh, today, we've got a lot of things to talk about in the show. In the beginning, we're going to talk about stock valuations, bringing up the Nifty 50. Also, we'll mention a little bit about AI, artificial intelligence. Also, talk about the graduates of today, what's going on. And we've got to hit Bitcoin a little bit, some changes there. Chase, what do you got? Well, as always, you want to join the show here. Phone number is 833-288-0973. Again, that's 833-288-0973. And gosh, I was going to say before we get into this, Elon Musk, Mark Zuckerberg, <laughs> who you got in a cage fight? I, you know, I, at first I was, I was thinking uh, um, uh, Zuckerberg because I saw some pictures of him training for jiu-jitsu. And I thought he was like, oh, he's probably been doing it for years. You said, no, he's a white belt. Yeah. <laughs> and I remember because you did jiu-jitsu, Nash took jiu-jitsu. Um, it's just something that you'll get some things. But Musk is a big guy. Yeah. I remember the interview he had with uh, David Faber on um, – on uh, CNBC, it's like he's big, yeah. And you know, if if he gets some just techniques and stuff, I, I think uh, Zuckerberg is not going to be able to do well. And I, I think uh, Musk tweeted something about his famous move called the Walrus, where he just lays on top of his <laughs> opponents. <laughs> but and I think Musk is a very um, you know driven guy. Right. So I think if they set a date, I think he's going to work out and figure out what to do so he can beat yeah. Zuckerberg. So He'll get some some I, I think I'm Team Musk. We'll see what happens. Yeah, I, I, because I, I think you're right. I think he'll he'll work out and stuff. And you took jujitsu for years, so you know that you can go against bigger guys if you know what you're doing. Uh, and I think Zuckerberg's probably going to be working pretty hard as well because neither one wants to be embarrassed. And I think they're going to raise a billion dollars for charity or something crazy. I thing. have no idea. That's what Dana White said he thinks because I think yeah. they're charging a hundred dollars. I'm not going to watch it. I'll, uh, I'll watch yeah. the highlights. I'm not going to pay a hundred dollars to watch yeah. that though. <laughs> yeah, no, I, that, I, that's not that, that that type of thing. But uh, <laughs> funny you brought that up. So. Strange things in the investment world, but uh, let's talk about some things that aren't so strange, and I want to talk about stock valuations, because the uh, the tech boom and bust is often referenced as an example of the dangers of high valuations in the stock market, but one that is less talked about is a nifty 50. Uh, this was a group of 50 stocks back in the early 70s that were known as one decision stocks, meaning you could buy and hold forever. Investors became enamored by the group and pushed valuations to extremely high levels due to the companies and their strong balance sheets, high profit margins, and double-digit growth rates. The group included names like Polaroid, which traded over 90 times earnings. And Xerox was also another one. That one traded at close to 50 times earnings. Come the stock market decline from 1973 to 1974, Polaroid fell by more than 90%, and Xerox was down close to 70%. Now, today we know these names went bankrupt and serve more as a history lesson rather than serving consumers. The Nifty 50 wasn't just about stocks like these, though. It included names like McDonald's and Disney. Now, McDonald's saw a P.E. of over 85 times. Disney traded a little over 81 times earnings. And then during the stock market fallout, McDonald's fell close to 62 percent and Disney was down close to 85 percent. Now, ultimately, investors need to be very careful chasing high valuation stocks as the risk to the downside can be very high. And we've talked about this a lot. And when you were talking about the beginning here about the names of the companies, the strong mm -hmm. balance sheets, high profit margins, double digit growth rates. Does that sound familiar mm, to you? A little bit, a little yes. Bit. <laughs> and and I've, I've talked about this a couple <clears throat> a couple weeks ago, how I think what we have now is more like the nifty 50 because these companies that are trading at high valuations are not bad companies. No. I mean, the same thing happened in the tech boom where you had Cisco. It wasn't a bad company. It just traded 120 times earnings. made no sense. Same thing's happening now, I believe. And here's a problem, Chase, is that uh, this is not going to falter on Monday. And people said, well, you've been, you've been concerned about these for, for a while now. Yeah. And it can continue on for a while. 
It, it can continue on for a month, six months, maybe even a year. We, we don't know. But the thing is, craziness doesn't last forever. And there's going to be no flashing light, no ringing of the bell that, oh, this nifty 50 same setup is coming. You need to get out of these high valuation stocks now. You, it's going to happen to where it's going to go down, then back up a little bit, then down. But, and then eventually you realize, like, wow, I'm, I'm down 50, 60 percent. And to see that on a Microsoft, on a Apple, on NVIDIA, it can very easily happen because they they are pushing against the laws of logic when it comes to investing. Yeah, and and one thing I, w- I want to bring up here as well that's, that's interesting, I've seen some people that point out, well, you know, some of these stocks are actually still good holds had you held them prior to the, the 70s right. to now. And uh, Jeremy Siegel actually had a research report on this, and it only went through the early 2000s, but he pulled out Disney as an example. And as I said, Disney fell <laughs> 85% during right. the 73, 74 decline. And through the early 2000s, Disney had averaged about 9.9% per year, even including that huge decline. Now, I have two problems with that argument. Number one, you see Disney stock go down 85%. Are you holding it? You don't know what <laughs> Disney's going to become in you know 30 years from now. Right. I mean, that is, I think, a very kind of silly argument. I mean, we know people, when things go down 30% many times, they get frustrated. 85 percent you kidding me most people are not gonna hold through that (laughs) and the other thing that i point out is how do you know if you have a disney or if you have a xerox yeah yeah and and the other thing too that i i tell people yeah when you look on a chart like yeah yeah i had held it it'd been fine so it's hold on but when day in and day out you look at that stock and it is down and it is down and then also too you have outside influence from the media from your friends from everybody you're doing the wrong thing. Get out. Oh, it's going bankrupt. No one holds on to that. Yeah. You've got to have, and that's why we talk about the fundamentals, because we've had companies that, again, we've, we've had that actually go down, but we've got the fundamentals hold on to. Like, no, they've got a strong balance sheet. We didn't overpay for it. We paid 12 times earnings. We didn't pay 85 times earnings for the company. So you've got something to hold on to where when you're just basing it on a theory, we'll call it, you're not going to do it. And that's why, you know, people say, oh, if you just invest in the S&P 500, you'd be fine. You're not going to do that either because eventually you're going to get bored with it and it's going to be down. And, and again, I'm talking like tomorrow on KSI, I'm, I'm going to be talking about uh, being your own bank. And I'm going to talk about the philosophy of not like months or even years, but decades of a philosophy that you think about that you can hold on to yeah. during this time frame. It's the same thing with investing. When you when you do crazy stuff, yeah. You can look at very quickly at a chart and say, yes, yeah, he had a held on and been fine. But day in, day out, you're not going to do that. That's why fundamental investing is so important. <laughs> and you talk about being your own bank. How do banks make money? On the spread. Yeah, on the spread. They lend long. Yep. <laughs> they don't lend short. They don't lend over the next six months. Many times. <laughs> 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 they, they lend on the long term, and, and that's where they make a lot of their money. Yeah, and and, it's true. and, and, and that is the key. That's one, you know, one of the keys I'll talk about is that you look longer term. And, and that's how banks become successful. It didn't happen overnight. You know, and if it doesn't happen overnight, we see that they falter. Um, but your good banks, J.P. Morgan, B of A, uh, over, it took them years to get to that level. And just by in the spread of generally 2 to 4%, you know, is how they made their money long term by having assets and loaning money and just doing the right things long term. And, and back to the Nifty 50, too, is, it, this is the hardest part about investing is when you look at things like this, it, it, you could be wrong for years. Yeah. And then it, it takes something to, to trip it up. I mean, the 70s weren't an easy time period by any means. That's when you had the impeachment of uh, Richard Nixon. Yeah. You had the whole Watergate scandal. You also had the oil embargo of uh, the Saudi Arabia oil embargo. I mean, there were some difficulties that came about. And the overall stock market struggled as well. But those names really pushed right. down the market as a whole. And we continue to think the same thing could happen. And I don't know, maybe what happens with these big tech companies is they just, again, go nowhere for years. But these stocks cannot trade at 50, 60 times earnings forever. And there's other ones, you know, like the Apples, Microsofts that trade at 30 times earnings. Are they going to get pushed up to 50 times earnings? (laughs) History tells us it could happen. Could happen, Yeah. yeah. But the reality is they can't trade at extremely high valuations forever. Right. And we may be wrong on the time frame and, oh, it should have been in those and so forth, but never been wrong on the fundamentals. Fundamental investing always works and it always will work. And, and like I said, we could be wrong on the next year, the next three years, the next five years, but I, I feel quite confident over the next 10 years, the Apples and Microsofts are, are not going to do that great. And, and I've said before, I really think what's going to happen with them is going to go up and down, up and down, kind of like uh, in the 
right after the what is out 2003 I think through 2012 I think it was they, they they didn't move very much well the Nasdaq as a reminder hit its peak in 2000 it didn't reach that peak again until 2015 yeah 15 years of, of that. that that's why I see going forward with a lot of these companies yeah. so that's why we talk about the fun amount and investing that's why we actually take the phone calls from people uh, later in this show that uh, you want to talk about a company that you're looking at buying selling or holding uh, we do that for you to go with the fundamentals to make sure you have a fundamental, fundamentally strong company. Uh, since I brought it up, I guess I'll go with the phone number, 833-288-0973, 833-288-0973. But uh, with all the talk about AI, I'm sure it's come across people's mind if it will replace financial advisors. I'm happy to report it. At this time, the answer is no. And as far as I can see in the future, I just don't see it happening. One has to remember that the information is still not 100% accurate. I also discovered from Andy Sawyer, who is a writer at Barron's Magazine, it doesn't include content. I didn't know this until uh, content after September 2021. Now, now that's a problem. Uh, a little over a week ago, a question was asked of chat GPT, which weighs more, <laughs> more, a pound of feathers or a pound of lead? Well, five pounds of lead. So one oh, pound sorry. of feathers Did or I mess five it up? pounds of oh, lead. You're going to mess it up I here. messed it up. I'm sorry. What weighs more, a pound of feathers or five pounds of lead? It said they weigh the same because there is that kind of out there on the internet of what weighs more, one pound of feathers or one pound of lead. They weigh the same. Right. So ChatGPT got stumbled up there, and obviously the five pounds of lead weighs more than one pound of feathers. <laughs> yeah. But remember that ChatGPT scans everything that has been written, which may not be relative and can give the wrong answer. What I do think it will accomplish is to help smart advisors who understand investing to obtain data quicker and perhaps more precisely as well. But whoever is reading that data still has to understand it or else it means nothing at all. I think it was a few years ago that the robo-advisor was going to replace many advisors. Well, we saw how that went not very well. Overall, I think AI will make us smarter and will allow us to do our jobs quicker but not replace jobs that still need the human brain to analyze the data or the human body to perform functions like a plumber or an electrician as well. And, you know, it's funny, Chase, I, I first started back in, in the 80s. Uh, we didn't have computers. We had a uh, yellow pad of paper. We had books. You had mail. You'd have to get in the mail to actually look at stuff. And like, oh, computers, they could replace financial advisors. You still need that human content. And what, again, we kind of mentioned that AI is going to help a lot of uh, professions uh, do their job better by getting information quicker uh, than before. And I will say that they'll have to improve that because obviously that September 2021, that's going to be a problem. I mean, that's two years ago. Yeah. I mean, if you're an advisor and you're looking for, you know, or an investor and you're looking for data, I don't care what happened two years ago. <laughs> that's going to be useless. <laughs> so, I mean, it, it, it's well, not useless because we talk about the Nifty 50, right. but you can learn history lesson, but when you're looking at a current investment, you need up-to-date information. Well, and you would miss all of 2022 with the rising inflation, rising interest rates. So, chat. GPT doesn't even know about that at this point in time, it sounds like. Yeah, I, I mean, it's definitely a problem. And I, I do think, you know, kind of talking about different professions, I, I was at uh, a buddy's bachelor party last weekend, actually. You were? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, one of my <clears throat> friends there, he he works for, uh, I think it's Axon, and they, they do you know, tasers and, and work with police departments and so forth. And he said right now they're they're working on utilizing AI to write, you know, the, the reports for police officers. Right. So, I mean, I mean, that would really help productivity because a lot of cops, from my understanding, don't like writing the reports. It's like mm -hmm. they want to go out there and be a cop. <laughs> right, you know? right, right. So it, it's something that can really help enhance, I think, different jobs and, and make us more productive and more efficient. But at the end of the day, I don't think it's going to completely wipe out every job, at least how, how it is at this current stage. Yeah, because I think it is going to help out a lot of things because it, you talked about productivity. That's the big thing it's going to do is increase productivity of cops. Uh, attorneys, uh, realtors, doctors, realtors uh, financial advisors, a lot of people, because our whole thing is getting information, information and, and analyzing that. If we can get more accurate information quicker, that's going to make us smarter at what we're doing as far as investing goes. Same thing for doctors and attorneys and uh, everybody else. And, and I, I will point out, this is one thing you have to understand with, you, you might be saying, well, I thought you guys had talked negatively about AI in the past. But what you need to understand from an investment standpoint is you don't know who the winners in AI are going right. to be 10 years from now. Maybe it is ChatGPT. Maybe there's another one that comes out. I mean, I know Google's working on their, their BARD. 
Uh, there's also, you know, maybe a new entrant in two, three years that completely wipes them out. So that's why we don't like to invest in what could be a, a big potential thing because all of a sudden you lose everything. Yep. And, you know, there could be one stock that's hot now that's not hot in five years. I mean, you always talk about what is it? Uh, gosh, you always use it when you talk about the tech boom and bust. GA Uniphase? Oh, JDS Uniphase. JDS Uniphase. Yes. Yes. Who the heck is JDS Uniphase? They were hot back in the tech boom and bust. <laughs> You know, is that going to be the same thing with ChatGPT 20 years from now? And they're still around. Yeah. But they still trade at $30 a share, and I think they hit a high of 300 Yeah. So, and that was over 20 years ago now. Mm -hmm. So, and, and that's the thing. You you don't know who's going to be hot. And that's why we always talk about, you know, true investing, buying small pieces of good companies at good prices. And, yeah, you may swing for the fences and hit the home run or most of the time going to strike out and you're going to be left with nothing. And that's why people say, oh, stock market's so risky. And we always say the stock market's not risky. You make it risky by doing stupid things. Yeah. And that's that's kind of the reality of what it is. So, yeah, I mean, it's a strategy of like saying, would you rather get on base, you know, two out of three times? Or would you rather hit a home run one in 20 times? I'd rather get on base two out of three times. Right. I mean, that's going to help you in the long term. Yeah. But. yeah. And, the, and you may never be the home run king, but you'll still be in the game because there's probably a lot of people in baseball that try to be the home run king, and they're now... Sweeping floors, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's move on and talk about graduates because this is kind of ties into AI a little bit. Uh, I just saw an unfortunate report that the percentage of high school graduates ages 16 to 24 that were enrolled in college in 2022 has fallen 62%. It fallen to 62%. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a big, big decline because you compare that to it's over a 4% drop from just 2019 when it was 66.2%. So there's a, a nice nice drop there. And I got to say real quick, I, I was kind of surprised that when I looked at this, I had to double check because you, you had written this post here. Mm -hmm. 16 to 24, I was like, I didn't know there's many 24-year-olds that are graduating high school, but <laughs> I guess they want to include everybody. Yes, they are trying to include everybody. <laughs> but it, it could also be because our colleges and universities are slowly pricing themselves out of the market to make it worthwhile to get a college degree. Or it could be younger people don't want to wait to start earning a living or start a career. It could also be a combination of the two there. And what I didn't write when I wrote that was too, and it could be that everybody wants to be an influencer or a pro gamer, you know, <laughs> so yeah. different things are going. Uh, they're kind of looking at the wrong direction many times as opposed to getting a good college degree. Uh, and again, I've talked many times, you don't need a college degree, but a good trade, be a plumber, be an electrician, be a, a mason, be things that are really needed. And I think a lot of kids, and I think it's great too. There's a lot of kids that want to be like entrepreneurs and stuff. And there, there's never been an easier time, in my opinion, to start a, a business than now, other than all the regulations. But you can reach so many more people so much more quickly. So I think a lot of kids maybe are trying that. I mean, but the thing is, the universities I think is the big problem. And I I personally think this is great because college has gotten way too expensive. Mm -hmm. It makes no sense. You look at the return on investment for most people. There's no way you're going to recoup those costs. And I think a lot of the money that has from colleges has gone to not even the instructors or professors, the administration administration side, yep. which I think is a shame where these admins are like becoming very, making these big salaries and stuff like, no, you guys shouldn't be making that. It should be the professors and actually you should keep the tuition lower. You guys don't need to get a million dollar salary for being a, a head of a college or whatever. Yeah, I, we've talked about it many times in the past, but I, we're big advocates of, you know, going the, the JUCO or the, the community college. JUCO. Uh, that's what we used to call it in football. Oh, uh, really? Uh, JUCO, I, junior college. I've never heard JUCO before. Yeah. So a, that's a JUCO transfer, yeah. Oh, wow, very cool. Yeah, so it, it's um, that's a, a great option for people right. because it, it, it allows you to kind of find yourself in the first two years and, and think about more what you want to do. Or a lot of times you go to college when you're 18, you don't know what the heck you want to do. Right. So this way it kind of gives you that two-year period where you're not wasting thousands of dollars yep. on school. Now, for some people, I'm not going to say college is wrong for everybody. It's not a blanket statement, but I think people need to think about it a little bit more. And I have read that we do push college too much in the country because you, you can make, and you know, a good friend of ours, Bill Howe, Bill Howe mm -hmm. Plumbing, I mean, they're plumbers. I don't want to get in trouble for this, but they make very good money. I, I, I mean... I believe he said after a few years, they're making six figures as a plumber. And it's just amazing that you can do that because of the fact that it's in demand. And not everybody is designed to go to college and sit behind a desk and, and do that. I, and I love what we do. I think you love what we do. Um, I was, people don't know this, 
I tried being a plumber when I was younger. I was terrible. I hated it. <laughs> yeah, I was not a good plumber. But I found what I wanted to do. And that's the main thing I, I want people to understand, too, is I always tell young people this. Do what you love because you'll be very successful at it if you do what you love. So, Yeah. Uh, <laughs> to a degree, I, I would say that. Because sometimes you, you got to find something you like enough. Because I always tell people, too, I love what I do. Right. But would I rather be on the beach in Hawaii? Heck yeah. You I know? Would, yeah. I, I, no, not all the time. You know? Well, not all the time, but I mean, if you could travel a lot more, right. I mean, actually, I don't like traveling that much, but you know, <laughs> if you could, it, my point is, is, is there's some people that you're not going to be able to necessarily do exactly what you love. You might love right. to play, play poker. Right. Well, that's not going to be a career. You still have to find that balance between finding what you love right. and still having it be a job at the and, end of the day. And also, too, you're not going to love it 100% of the time. There's times I'm on, in our running my company and so forth, like, man, it's hard. Yeah. It's really hard. And it's, there's times, like, I think I need to go uh, take a break, you know. I mean, it's not 100% all the time. So we got way off track. We did. Let's get back on track. Oh, let me get the phone number because we're going we're, we're gonna to open the phone lines in a, uh, about a minute here. Uh, you want to get through for that unbiased, no strings attached, fundamental opinion about what you want to talk about. Phone number 833-288-0973. That's 833-288-0973. Well, we got to talk about it again because it's in the news this past week. We're talking about Bitcoin. I saw Bitcoin was up 10% due to excitement over ETS being launched for Bitcoin. BlackRock filed an application earlier in the week for a spot Bitcoin ETF that would track Bitcoin's underlying market price. Well, to me, <laughs> this is just silly. I'm sorry. And when I look at it, you know, why would somebody buy an ETF, which, again, I'm sure BlackRock isn't doing this for free. I'm sure they're going to charge a fee for that when all the ETF is doing is following the price of Bitcoin. <laughs> Wouldn't it just make more sense to make Bitcoin if it's so easy to buy Bitcoin? Like, <laughs> I, I just I don't get it. And unfortunately, when an asset has no true fundamentals, this is the kind of news it will trade on. And this is the problem with it because it trades on news like this to the upside, but it'll fall to the downside very dramatically if something negative comes right. out because there's no fundamentals to it. And here's my hate for this, I guess I'll call it. Wall Street finds ways to make money at the expense of the small investor. And Wall Street's going to make a lot of money off this. If it goes through, I'm I'm still wondering. I mean, the SEC is on the other side pushing it. Is this really going to go through? I don't think it's through yet, is it? It's not through yet. So we'll, we'll see if this goes through. But, but again, here is Wall Street again. They don't care if the investor makes money. They just want to make money themselves. We can talk about the, the SPACs. We can talk about the NFTs. We can talk about all these things that Wall Street comes up with. Uh, and, and I've been doing this for over 40 years. It's happened over and over again. I, I can't even think of all the crazy things Wall Street comes out with. They make billions of dollars. And then investors lose money because they're getting an ETF that is backed by nothing that is, has nothing in it. Well, and I'm very curious. Is the BlackRock CEO going to be buying this ETF? My guess is probably not. And, you know, I have great respect for Jamie Dimon, as an right. example. But I remember people were like, oh, Jamie Dimon used to hate Bitcoin. Now he likes it. No, Jamie Dimon hates Bitcoin, but they right. started offering some cryptocurrency services at J.P. Morgan because they didn't want to lose clients. Right. And ultimately, J.P. Morgan makes money off of that. And the CEO has to look at saying, well, if our competitor is doing it, we should do it as well just so we don't lose it. doesn't mean they're supporting it. Right. But I, I just – it makes no sense. I, I just – that's what I leave it at. I, I, what what does Bitcoin even do? What's the purpose? Is it? It's still not usable for transactions in an efficient yeah. manner. Uh, it takes a lot of energy. I'm speechless. It just it doesn't do anything. <laughs> yeah. I was gonna let, I was gonna let you finish being speechless because I know yeah. you're trying to get something. But again, there's nothing to really say about it. I mean, there's a lot to say about it, but it, it's just something that you know. The reason why it's exciting because it goes up in value and people make money on it, but it's not backed by anything. Um, and people, there's uh, your Bitcoin advocates out there, it's like, oh, Brent, you don't get it. Like, okay, I'm fine, I don't get it. But the thing is, I do get the concept of money and investing, and Bitcoin does not fall under that at all. And there's a gentleman on CNBC the other day. Uh, I know you read his book. He wrote a Walk Down Wall Street, I believe, is the, the title of the book. Oh, and yes. He's a very intelligent gentleman. And he was like, I was a Bitcoin advocate for the beginning because he was frustrated with the Fed. Right. But he's like, as I thought about it more, it can't replace the Fed. And people that are upset about, you know, 
the concentration of wealth, this would be a huge issue as well. If we switched to Bitcoin, there'd be people that didn't really do anything necessarily to provide value to mm -hmm. the, the country or the economy. They'd have all the wealth in Bitcoin because they bought Bitcoin before. Anybody. <laughs> it just it, it wouldn't work as a system. And it it just makes no sense at the end of the day. Yeah. yeah. And and that's the thing. And here it is going up again. If you bought it 20, I think it went down to 25,000. You bought 25,000. Well, congratulations. You made about 20%. I think it's around 30,000 now. But what's a catalyst to keep it going forward? Um, yeah. You've got an ETF that is just tracking Bitcoin. Um, it, it, it's just, it, it, again, we're speechless on it because it makes no sense. And I've seen this happen before. Uh, my 40 years of different things and it's going to be the same thing and we have seen little investors already burnt by it people that bought it sixty thousand dollars that are still sitting with it at thirty thousand yeah congratulations if you bought it 25 you're now up 20 percent but you bought it at sixty thousand you're still down 50 percent yeah so, um it's just makes no sense Makes no sense. Well, we got all lines open. No one's calling in here. I, I guess everybody's okay with the uh, w with their investments. But uh, in case you're one of those that, that that's not and saying, "Gosh, I got this company it's in my portfolio, or the stock, and I'm not sure if I should buy more of it. Should I sell it? Maybe you found something that looks like a good buy, but you got what? You got something? I had something real quick. I was sure. just very curious on it because I was thinking, you know, maybe the reason people are like, "Oh, the ETF," because now people can buy it in retirement accounts. <laughs> Well, Coinbase actually offers traditional Roth and SEP IRAs, so you could buy Bitcoin already <laughs> in your IRA. That, that's the only thing I was thinking. I was like, maybe that's why people are excited about it. Right. But, nope, you can already do that. And then you had, what, Grayscale, I think it was. You like Grayscale. I mean, there's other things you could have played into it. It's it just, again, another thing from Wall Street coming out with this ETF to make tons of money off it for people to lose money on. So... So back to my promo on the the phone lines. Yeah, here. sorry about that. That's I just, okay. No, that was important. I was very curious on that. So yeah, that, that was important. But uh, again, so you, you've got a company that you're looking at maybe buying, selling, or holding, or you, you found something. You think, gosh, you know, maybe I should invest in this company. I'm not sure. That's what we're here for. To give you that second opinion. Phone number is eight three three two eight eight zero nine seven three. That's eight three three two eight eight. 0973. Well, let's go out to San Diego and speak with Val. Val, you're in the Smart Invest Show, Brent Chase. How can we help you? Yes. Uh, yeah, having a little bit of trouble hearing you. We, we, we do hear that you want Patterson UTI Energy Incorporated, symbol PTN. So we'll We'll look at that for you, and, and uh, we'll, we'll keep you on the line if we can. If we lose you, then we'll, we'll be doing this on the line here for you. Again, the company is a Patterson UTI Energy, symbol PTN. They're in the oil and gas drilling uh, industry. Wow, I'm surprised. 11.7% uh, short on the float, so there's some people out there shorting this uh, the stock here. Uh, we do see that uh, institutional ownership 103.5%. Well, how can that happen? Because it's short side. Uh, we do see a nice P-E ratio, 8.9 versus 14%. Price to sales, 0.9. That's above the industry of 0.5. Price to book value, 1.4 versus 1.7. And price to cash flow, that checks in at 3.3 versus 5.3. And peg ratio, 0.1 versus 0.2. So valuation ratio is looking pretty good here. <clears throat> we do see on the growth rate for the earnings per share for one year, nothing there. But five years, 36.7%. We do see sales on the one year up 80.3% versus industry down 4.5. Wow, the five year earnings per share, per share estimated growth rate from the analyst, 83% for Patterson. That's pretty amazing, but 77% for the whole industry. Chase, we got to look into this these company in this industry. I think it's what natural gas, I think is what it is. Uh, oil. 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 Okay. Wow, okay. Well, that's, yeah, we got to look into that. Something strange here. Uh, dividend yield, 2.8%. Only use 18% of their earnings to pay that out. Uh, they do use, uh, let's see, dividend growth was 100%. Wow, there's strange numbers on this company. Balance sheet, 1.6% current ratio versus 1.7. Debt to equity, 0.5 versus 1.1. <clears throat> Net profit margin, 9.7 versus a negative 0.6. Return on equity, 16.9. That's a positive. The industry is a 0.7 minus. So what do you got going forward? I'm, I'm really kind of confused on this company. A well, bit. well, just to kind of <clears> let <throat> people know what it does, because uh, a lot of people probably never heard of Patterson UTI Energy. It's one of the largest land 
rig drilling contractors in the U.S. and uh, maintains also moderately sized pressure pumping operations primarily in Texas and the Appalachian region, plus some modest operations in Colombia. Also provides directional drilling services and tool rental services in most U.S. onshore oil and gas basins. So I'd be curious. I mean, it looks like I do oil and gas, so I'd want to know where they're a little more focused. But looking at the current price here, it's eleven dollars and forty-two cents. Fifty-two week high, nineteen dollars and eighty-one cents. And wow, look at the fifty-two week low, nine dollars and seventy cents, down thirty-one point two percent to start the year. It, it's a decent sized company, actually, a two point three billion dollar market cap. Now, if we go out to December two thousand twenty-four, I do see estimated earnings per share of one dollar and eighty-nine cents would give us a target sell price of $31.37, and that's based off nine analysts as well, which I'm kind of surprised they have that many. Also very curious on this because this year they're estimated to grow earnings 139%, and next year they're estimated <coughs> to grow earnings still another 11%, but we know when I look at other energy companies, they're really kind of struggling because the, the oil prices have fallen quite substantially since their, their peaks last year. So I, I'm very curious on how this company is able to to grow earnings at, at such a drastic rate. And I do, I do see the earnings are down about uh, oh, 18% over the past 90 days, down to that 187 you're talking about. Um, it, it just seems like there's something here. And oil right now is around $68 a barrel. I don't see it staying there. I don't believe the government. I think they've talked about it but they have not come back online yet to start buying more oil for the strategic petroleum reserves. And also too, China is just ramping up. So I think on the second half of the year, we could see, unfortunately for the heating season, uh, oil back up into the 80s, which I believe oil companies will benefit at that point in time. Yeah, because I don't think we're going to see oil like we saw last year. I think a lot of that has really faded. The case for that yeah. has faded. But yeah. I, I think these low levels don't make much sense. I think there's still a lot of concern over a, a big global slowdown or a big right. global decline, I'll say. Not a slowdown, a big global decline. I, I don't necessarily see a huge global decline. Again, we are more in the camp of a, a slowdown that uh, I think would really help increase the cost for a lot of these commodities. I mean, we talk about copper as well. Copper has really pulled back substantially as well in terms of the, the pricing for it. These commodities have gotten hit because of this concern, and I, I just don't see that holding up over the next two, three, yep. four years. So, so I, I like the company. I think there's something there, but you got to do a little more research on it. So, um, uh, Val, we're going to let you go because I don't think we can uh, have a good connection there, but Val, I hope that uh, helps out. Phone number is 833-288-0973. Gosh, I look over. I think we had all the phone lines uh, open. Uh, gosh, let, let's let's go back to, wow, another one just came in. Uh, let's go out to uh, Chula Vista and speak with Chief. Chief, you're on the Smart Investor over in Chase. How can we help you? Hey, hey, good morning, fellas. How you doing? Uh, well, things are good. Uh, I'd just like to, to hear your take on 3M uh, after, you know, just recently they – uh, had that big settlement for their forever chemicals and um, I'm primarily a, a dividend investor and uh, just would like to get your take on whether uh, it's time to uh, to get 3M or kind of hold off a little bit um, see if it drops and then starts picking up again uh, right now it's kind of floating around uh, the hundred dollar mark uh, but yeah, I'd just like to get your take, if you if you don't mind. Yeah, because this is something that we, we saw in the news, and we've been kind of watching ourselves. So let's kind of run over the numbers, kind of talk about as we go through. They uh, come again as 3M, symbols MMM, uh, only 2.2% of flow there in the industry of conglomerates, so just a huge company. Uh, P ratio 10.4 versus 10, that's very attractive. Price to sales 1.7, that's above the industry, surprised at 0.6%. Uh, Price of tangible book value, not material versus 7.1 for the industry. So you got to remember that if you take away all the intangible assets, there's really no value to this company. And you got that lawsuit in the background, which really kind of worries us. Price of cash flow, 9.7 versus 7.1. Peg ratio, 7.2 versus 48.6. So that's a positive. Over the past year, earnings did climb 0.7%, uh, not far below the industry at 2.8. However, uh, sales for 3M were down 5.4%, industry at 27.8. Five-year growth rate on uh, 3M is 1.6%, still not much below the industry at 2%. They do pay a 6% dividend and use 61.5% of their earnings to pay that out. So that's still a pretty attractive uh, payout ratio, even with that 6% dividend. Uh, we do see on the balance sheet, you got a current ratio 1.4, same as the industry. Debt to equity 1.1 versus 1. 
Net profit margin still very good, 16.3 versus 6.2, and return on equity very high, 35.7 versus 15.8. Chase, what do you got uh, for the earnings going forward? As a current price here for 3M is $100.72. 52-week high, well, that's $152.30, and the low is $92.38. If we go out to December 2024, do see estimated earnings per share of $9.57 would give us a target sell price of $158.86. So the numbers look very good for 3M, and I'll tell you, it's very intriguing. My big concern is still those earplug lawsuits out there. Yep. And also, when you talk about the settlement here, the, I think it's a few billion dollars is what they agreed to pay for the Forever Chemicals. What you're seeing is still that the balance sheet's in an okay spot. Well, now they're going to have to pay that off. I'm not sure when that's going to occur. That's going to increase the debt to equity. Could also hurt their dividend payout. Not to mention, if this goes south on the earplug side, that could really destroy their balance sheet. And uh, there's an analyst talking yesterday on CNBC saying they might have to cut that dividend which would really put pressure on the stock if they do cut that right. dividend. <clears throat> I will tell you, I would be very interested if they cut the dividend, though. I, I think it could present an opportunity at that point. Right. And one thing I'm wondering, too, is any of this uh, insurance uh, or any of this loss insured, could be some insurance that it comes up to get, get some of that uh, paid there. And, and also, I was looking, too, at the earnings uh, for December 2024. The range is still pretty tight. I got 17 analysts, 890 is a low, <clears throat> 10 is a high. So that's still pretty good. So... I, I mean, I still like this company. I, I still feel uncomfortable getting into it yet. But uh, I, I and I think you said, Chief, you hold it or looking to buy it? Uh, well, right now I'm holding it, but uh, <clears throat> just kind of wondering if I should uh, continue to to buy more. Well, we like it, but I but I think we and again, Chase, I didn't talk about this, but we feel like there could be perhaps a twenty percent drop out there in the stock. Well, yeah, it's, it's so hard because it's yeah. that, that potential liability right now, and there's not enough to wrap your arms around because you're getting these individual claimants coming through on the the, um, the, the earplugs. And if all of a sudden you get a class action, that would give you a little more clarity. And maybe the stock goes up to 105, <clears throat> 110, but at least at that point, you know what the potential liability is because all of a sudden, if that lawsuit comes in way higher than people are anticipating, that's where you could see the stock fall to 70, 80 because yeah. it, it could be quite detrimental and it, it could really cripple the business. So, I mean, that's the big potential liability that if I held this stock, I would be doing a lot of reading and a lot of research on what's going on with those lawsuits. Yeah, Kirk, that's that's what it's going to come down to. And also, to that balance sheet, remember all the intangible assets? Yep. Uh, they've got debt there on, on the balance sheet. And if they do lose these lawsuits and, and then not insured and they got to pay billions of dollars. I mean, it could, I'd hate to say it, but you could see 3M actually file bankruptcy because that, I've seen this happen where they, they don't want to pay it. So they file bankruptcy and they get out of it. Well, especially you look at saying their, their debt to equity would have to increase because they're going to take cash to pay out the, the, the claims, right? Then they'd also probably have to write off part of the business, so that would hurt their intangible assets. Right. So their debt to equity could climb at a rate to be like, "Whoa, what the heck happened here?" So I mean, there's yeah. <clears throat> there's there's some serious questions, I guess, that, that I would say the numbers look great, but but that lawsuit is a big question. And, and I almost feel like the company trades here, Chief, like the lawsuit is not going to go bad. I mean, it traded hundred dollars a share, and what it's trading at. I mean, that's still a pretty good level. I, mean, yeah. I, I think that's still favored. If that were to turn. I think you'd see the stock drop dramatically. So, uh, percentage-wise, Chief, how much does it make up in your portfolio? Uh, right now, it's at uh, honestly, it's it's pretty low. It's probably at about uh, maybe two percent or so. Okay, yeah, that, that, I'd probably sit there. I don't, I don't see this way here. If it does go up, you're going to win. But if you do buy more and it goes down, like oh shoot, I should have sat there. Yeah. So I'd, I'd I'd be patient, read more about what's going on, and stay on top of it because there's a lot of potential, but there's a lot of high high risk there too. Already? Sure. Yeah, I appreciate it, guys. All right, Chief. Thanks for calling. Have a good one. Bye-bye. All right. You too. All right. That does open the phone line, 833-288-0973. I see we've got Anthony, Jim, and Jim, and Rich. Uh, stay with us. We'll get to you. Uh, oh, yeah. I was like, where did Harrison go? <laughs> uh, we don't want to go to financial planner, Harrison Johnson. Good morning, Harrison. How are you doing this morning? Good morning, guys. How are you doing? Good, good. I mean, you got uh, – today you're talking about uh, – Delaying Social Security benefits, I believe, is what we're talking about. Yeah, I wanted to kind of talk about the value of that. So um, so you can collect Social Security at any point between age 62 and 70. You don't need to wait until a certain calendar year, birthday, or anything like that. And as far as your quote-unquote full retirement age goes, all that means is that's the point where you can 
collect Social Security and continue to work, and uh, you will not have any of your Social Security reduced. If you try to collect Social Security before that full retirement age and you still have a job, um, then you could see a reduction in that Social Security amount. So that calculation is for every $2 you make above $21,240, uh, Social Security will withhold $1 uh, worth of benefit from you. So as soon as you reach that full retirement age, which is 67 for a lot of people, you're no longer subject to that $21,000 a year income limit and can earn as much as you want. So that's all the full retirement age means. There's no extra boost or tax change that comes along with that point. So um, for every month you wait to collect on your Social Security between those ages 62 and 70, the payment that you get will get a little bit larger, and it comes out to about 8% per year on average. So for every year you wait, that benefit goes up around 8% or so. So the problem is people assume that they are receiving a guaranteed 8% return per year by deferring Social Security, which is not true. That's not the same thing. An 8% increase in the payment is not the same as an 8% return per year. And the reason is Social Security will eventually stop paying you when you die. So you're getting 8% more per year for waiting, but that also means you're going to be collecting for one less year. So if you could calculate a return, it's, it's going to be less than 8%. Um, the calculation of it is actually you know, a little bit more complicated than that, and really that's not, I don't think, the right way to look at it. It's far more appropriate to put a value on the cash flow that you would receive as opposed to, to trying to extrapolate a percentage return number. So to simplify all that, if you're someone who invests your money all the way through retirement, which everybody should, you might be better off collecting sooner, even though you're going to get a smaller monthly amount because it, it comes in as a nice supplement to the other income that you have. Because again, you're not getting an 8% return from Social Security by waiting. Um, there are people out there who should defer it if you're still working, or there's just people that don't like to invest their money and have long, long life expectancies, or if there's people that have a big age gap between their spouse, then it can make sense to defer um, but I, I just wanted to touch on that 8% per year number and, and really what that means. And, and Harrison, th this is what you do. You you always analyze things a lot more. People say, oh, yeah, yeah, just take Social Security. Oh, no, don't take Social Security. There's so much more behind the scenes that you go over to look at that situation to say it does make sense. It's not a, an easy call either way. And you laid out a good thing because everybody says, oh, yeah, just, just delay it because you're going to get 8% more. That's like getting 8% more of your money. No, not true. Yeah, I know, because that's a big thing people always, uh, well, can you guarantee 8%? I, mean, I can't guarantee it. I mean, right. we, we think we can average 8, 10, maybe 12%. That, that's a reasonable expectation investing properly. But, yeah, you can't guarantee. So people are always like, well, I get the guaranteed 8%. I've never thought about it that way. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, it, it comes down to the numbers, but you have to understand how to analyze and, and really understand what those numbers mean. So 8% increase is not an 8% return. It might sound a little odd, but, you know, if you actually look at the math, that's, they're not the same. Yeah, and if you have an investment that's compounding at uh, 9%, you're going to get more than 8% eight years down the road. So, it, it, yeah, I mean, this is why you got to go through the numbers, and that's why when somebody comes into you, I, I see in there, because I can see my your office, my office, and I see, like, yeah, he's still in there, but an hour and a half of this person, he's still in there talking. <laughs> <laughs> yep, still drawing all the numbers on the whiteboard, drawing it all out, making sure it makes sense. <laughs> Well, Harrison, thank you very much. Uh, uh, great information on Social Security and, and why not to delay it, or maybe you should delay it. The thing is, they got to talk to you to find out whether they should or not. <laughs> there, there you go. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, we'll see you Monday. Again, that's uh, all right. Har thanks, guys. See you Monday. All right, bye bye. Uh, again, it's uh, Harrison Johnson, our uh, financial planner, our CFP. He is a fee based planner. He does not uh, charge commission. Does not uh, sell you insurance products or any type of products at all, for that matter. Uh, he's a fee based. So if you want to give him a call, talk to him and get an unbiased opinion about a financial plan for you, give him a call at the office, 858-546-4306. That's 858-546-4306. Or go to our website, smartinvesting2000.com. Again, that's smartinvesting2000.com. And sign up for that free consultation with him right there. All righty. Let's go back to the phones here. Let's go down to Chula Vista and speak with Jim. Jim, you're on the Smart Invest Show, Brent Chase. How can we help you? 
I'd like to know what your opinion is of IP, international paper. Okay, do you hold that or look at it buy it? Yeah, just bought some. I'm about one point in the hole on it, which is a, a big deal. Okay. But uh, I just wanted your opinion on it. I'm after the dividend, and I see, feel it's going to eventually cycle back up to the upper 30s, and I think it's a good buy at this point. Okay, so so you said you're down about a point on it. So, uh, and again, I would not yeah. be worried about that because you want to buy a no. good company. So let's verify this is a good company because I've known about IP for a long time, international paper, symbol IP. They're in the packaging and containers industry, and this is one that – I just don't, and I don't know that much about the company, but I don't see how this would ever go out of business because you always got things that have to be sent by packaging. So uh, about 3.2% float, not bad. 88% institutional owned. Uh, we do see a very nice PE ratio of 6.8, and that's below the packaging and container industry of 16.2. So that's a positive. Price to sales, 0. 0.5 versus 0. 0.8. Price to tangible book value, 2.1 versus not material for the industry. Price of cash flow, 5.7 versus 9.1. And I love this peg ratio because uh, the lower the number, the better. Uh, 0. 0.7 versus 32 for the industry. Now, we do see the earnings per share growth of last year. We're up 44.7%, well above the industry at 18%. However, sales are only up 4.7% above the industry at 1.8%. So you have to kind of realize those earnings are some kind of accounting thing going on or something happened the previous year. But I like the numbers so far on the sales and earnings growth. Even the five-year earnings per share estimated growth by the analyst, 19.2%, well above the analyst at 2.9. So that's a positive. And wow, a, a dividend of 6.1%, and they only use 50% of their earnings to pay that uh, dividend out. So that's a big positive there. They have what's called a buyback yield of 9.7 versus 2.9. So they're buying back a lot of stock, it appears. Uh, on the balance sheet, current ratio 1.6, same as the industry. Debt to equity 0.7 versus 1.9. Net profit margin 6.3 versus 4.7. Return on equity 15.7 versus 14.9 for the industry. Uh, you got to excuse me. I'm going to go buy this stock right now. I don't think I found one thing bad on that unless you got something <laughs> to destroy the party here, Chase. Well, just looking at the current price here for international paper IP against the ticker symbol, $30.60. 52 week highs, $45.17. And the low is $29. So pretty Pretty darn out near close to that low there. Going forward to December 2024, I do see estimated earnings per share of $2.53. Would give us a target sell price of actually about $42 a share. Trades at around 12 times earnings. Now, the only bad news I really see oh, here on we go. It bad news. Okay, is we go. December 2023. So for the full year, those earnings are estimated to decline 39%. So there's definitely something mm. that happened with the accounting where the earnings went up 40%, and now they're coming back down to a more normalized level. So it, it just seems like there's some one-time accounting effects that, that I just want to understand. But, but it, to be honest, that doesn't really bother me that much if you could figure that out. And I will say we were interested in this type of industry pre-COVID in like 2018, 2019, because we knew e-commerce was expanding. Right. We decided to go a different direction to benefit from e-commerce. But, um, you know, I'm kind of curious by this now because there was such big growth during COVID. It pulled back. I wonder if that's pressured the stock because we know e-commerce has slowed down. So packaging may have slowed down. But it, I think it should reaccelerate as we go forward at a more normalized rate. And I think this is just a, a good, solid, long-term hold uh, I do see, unfortunately, earnings over the last uh, nine days were down about 12.8%. The estimates from 289 to about 252. But this is just a good, I think it's a, a good solid company on sale. You're not going to ever see probably a 30% return per year on this company. But with that 6% dividend, I think that dividend, didn't look at the cash flow statement, but I think that dividend appears to be safe. You'll probably get on this company for the next five to 10 years, 10, 12, maybe a 14% average return per year over the long term. And it's not going to move very much, but it's one that you can kind of sleep with at night. I'll put it that way. I, I would want to know, though, is, again, their business segments. Yeah. What, what do they serve? Because obviously, international paper, how much do they do in paper still? I mean, we know papers <laughs> slow down in terms of the business size. But, uh, again, more of that packaging. Who are their customers? What type of packaging they, do they do? Because there is different type of packaging now. It's not just all the corrugated boxes. I remember looking at that yeah. years ago. You know, there's the poly bags, different types of packaging. Right. So make sure they kind of have that diversified packaging business would be something of interest. Yeah, and, and I think, Jim, I, as I said, I really love this company. I think, as Chase said, you really do have to understand more of the company's doing because there is no doubt that paper is being less used. 
Uh, I don't know about books. I mean, books, are there less books out there? So less paper. I, I mean, paper is on the downside, but packaging's on the upside. So you really have to understand this business, but I, I just think it's a good quality business that you'll hold. You'll, you'll never, you, you go to a party, you talk about it, you'll be in the corner by yourself. But I think uh, 10 years from now, you said, yeah, I did pretty good on international paper. All righty. Okay, thanks a lot, guys. All right, thank you. Have a good one. Bye-bye. Good. All right, that opens the phone line, 833 833- Two eight eight zero nine seven three. That's eight three three two eight eight zero nine seven three. Let's go up to San Diego and speak with Jim in San Diego. Jim, you're on the Smart Invest Show, Brent Chase. How can we help you? Out? How you doing today? Good. How you doing? Good. So I got a question for you. I've got a couple of the holdings here, um, stock holdings. I've got uh, Home Depot and Lowe's, and had them for years, and they perform rather well. Um, just recently I read, you know, that a lot of retail stores, uh, Lowe's included in there are closing at certain locations. Um, and, uh, I mean, sometimes that's a good thing, obviously for the (laughs) the stocks. Uh, but, uh, my concern is, um, you know, I, I do, I do see the price fluctuating recently quite a, quite a bit with Home Depot and Lowe's. I was told, uh, I want to get your opinion on this. Uh, I was told by a tax advisor it may be a good idea to go f- with Costco and BJ's, which is another retail store similar to Costco, um, to, to, to trade the, my, my holdings with uh, Lowe's and Home Depot for Costco and, and BJ's. Um, what, 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 do you, what do you see on that? Did you have a gain in Home Depot and Lowe's as well, a big gain? Um, for years I've been doing well with them. Okay. Right. Um, but um, recently, my, my concern, like I said, I, I saw Lowe's was clo- closing some locations, and I was just wondering if that was a red flag. Like I said, I know sometimes that's a good thing because, uh, you know, the, the, the profit actually goes up sometimes after they close. But I'm just wondering what, what, what you see as far as, uh, you know, what I have and, and as far as trading those for a Costco and BJ's. Yeah, and this is uh, so much more complex than you say, oh, well, so sell Home Depot and Lowe's and buy Costco or BJ's because actually very quickly based on our quick analysis and our history, uh, I think Costco is too expensive. We have seen that BJ's looks pretty good, but I don't know if I would sell, and I think Home Depot is more expensive than Lowe's. I'm going to go over the numbers for Lowe's for you because that's what kind of came up on the screen here because it, it, it does take more, and this is why investors don't do well. They just do things very quickly, and your accountant's probably a great accountant, probably a great tax guy, and I think he probably said, ah, eh, maybe you should just do this. Uh, I think he's trying to tell you do more research on it, but uh, let's just look at Lowe's because I don't think Lowe's should be sold uh, and I hear more concern on that. So Ho- Lowe's is in the home improvement retail industry. Th- there's not much short on it, 2.2%. So people don't think it's going to go down. Uh, we got a PE ratio of 20.6 versus 19 for the industry. That's okay. Price of sales, 1.4 versus 1.6. Unfortunately, they have no price of tangible book value. Uh, did they just report earnings, Chase? No, that was a while ago. Yep. So uh, they were okay. I know they bought back a ton, a ton of stock. stock. Yeah, they have been buying a lot of stock. And I remember looking at this or somebody else I'm, that you brought that up. That does concern me because I think that's going to slow down because they don't have a lot of cash like they used to have. Uh, continuing on here, the pig ratio, 2.4 versus 15.3. That's a positive. Now, the earnings over the past year are down 15.5%. The industry is down 0.6%. Sales for Lowe's are only up 0.3%, industry up 1.6%. So those two numbers concern me somewhat. They do pay a 2% dividend, use 40% of the earnings to pay that out, uh, which is okay. Uh, looking at the balance sheet here, we got a current ratio 1.3, same as the industry. Debt to equity, not material. Now, either they have no equity or their debt exceeds the equity. I did not know that. I don't think that was a problem before. It appears to be a problem now. They have no equity because there's no book value. No book value. Oh, I, that's right. I forgot about that. Okay. Uh, net profit margin, 6.7 versus 8.4. Return equity, a negative 43.1. Um I, I I I used to like Lowe's. I'm not feeling very comfortable right now. What do you got going forward, Jay? I've talked about this in the past with Home Depot and Lowe's. Is I yeah. know they have 
rental equipment. I don't oh, yeah. know how big of a business that <laughs> is for them, though, because what happens when you rent out equipment, it skews the balance sheet a little bit. So it, it would take a little time to look into that because if there is that rental business that is occupying a part of the balance sheet, that may give me more comfort in it. Uh, but as Brent pointed out, I am a little bit nervous about how much stock they've bought back and how if that can be continued going forward. If not, that could hurt the demand for the stock, which could hit the stock price. But looking at the current price, four lows is $215.22. The 52-week high is $223.31. The low is $170.76. I see year-to-date is up about 9.1%. I go forward to January 2025. I do see estimated earnings per share of $14.61. I mean, Wood gives a target sell price of $242.53. So the, the valuation on Lowe's still looks okay. It'd be in our hold category. Uh, I'm not overly excited about it, but I, I don't think I would ever recommend to sell that and go to Costco. Costco trades at close to 35 times future earnings at this point. Costco, great company, is way too expensive. Lowe's at least has, has the, the stronger valuation, I would say, over the two. Yeah, and and Jim, I mean, I, I think you kind of hear, I don't know if you're new to the show or not, but it, it takes a lot of analysis and to, to look at, you know, all four companies uh, and what you should be doing with it. This is why either you got to do it yourself or hire somebody to actually do the analysis for you to make good decisions going forward. Uh, but I am kind of disappointed on Lowe's. I, I I think it used to be a buy for us and that has now come to a hold. And I remember looking at it. They've used a lot of cash to buy back stock. So my concern is to continue, to continue doing that. Do they have to now start borrowing money, which we don't like? So, um, All four companies you're looking at could all be maybe not good ones to buy. And I I do think the home improvement area, my personal opinion is I think it's going to slow down, but then I think it's going to re-accelerate it. And I looked at like existing home sales. Existing home sales, there's only 1 million homes out there for sale right now. That's the lowest since the National Association of Retailers. Realtors has been tracking that since 1983. Inventory is so low, and I think with the low mortgage rates, people just aren't going to buy homes as much in the next five years, so I think people will improve them. So I think that's a catalyst for lows. but the question is, is it going to the stock going to do well? I think a lot of that's built into it, and, and right now the valuations are okay, but the balance sheet does worry me a lot. And also too, Jim, I think it depends on your, uh, your the rest of your portfolio. Uh, you know, what else do you have in the portfolio? I mean, one thing I'm thinking that this is just very quick, gosh, maybe you should sell Lowe's and buy international paper. You know, but it depends on other things you have. It depends on what you you're looking at doing. So I I think it comes down. You've got to do something. Uh, you you made I think a great start by giving us a call, but you got I think some research to to kind of do or hire somebody to actually do it for you, which obviously we do. Um, to get a good portfolio uh, that's going to continue to you know give you gains down the road. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. All right, Jim. Well, thanks for calling, and uh, you have a good one. You as well. Thanks. Bye bye. Well, that was a fun one, wasn't it, Chase? Yeah, a lot of a lot of thoughts and considerations there to to look at. Yeah, and 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 Jim does face a lot of problems like people do have, where uh, you've got some good companies. Uh, your accountant brought up the thing like, gosh, maybe you should sell them. It gets you th- thinking, and you've got to do the analysis to say. And, and again, as I try to say to Jim, it's very important to look at the whole thing because. And I'm just throwing this out here. Maybe the rest of his portfolio is all in Microsoft. Like, oh my gosh, that'd be terrible. I mean, he's probably done well. But you've got to build that that good diversified portfolio of good businesses that will weather the storm and do well going forward. And the other thing you look at as well is just because you have a retailer doesn't mean you need to sell a retailer and buy another retailer. Good point. You want to look at maybe adding something that you don't have. I mean, maybe there's a good utility company on there. You don't have any utilities. I mean, just because you have something in that specific field, don't feel the need to trap yourself in a box. And it could actually hurt you because if all a retailer gets hit, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's not yeah. going to really matter. That yeah, much. if we have a slowdown in the economy, which I don't think we'll have that major one there. but And that there will be some retailers that do better than other retailers. But you bring up a very good point. I, I think there's probably, I'm going to guess, like 25, 30 different industries. We don't hold every industry. You don't have to hold every industry. We try to find industries that will do well in the next three to five years. Could be a retailer, could be a financial company, could be whatever. Or it could be the closing bell just popped up. So thank you for listening to the Smart Investing Show. It is for informational person only and should not be used as investment advice. If you'd like to discuss in more detail your investment needs, have other investment questions, feel free to call myself Brent Wilsey or Chase Wilsey at 858-546-4306. That's 858-546-4306. Or visit our website, smartinvesting2000.com. That's smartinvesting2000.com. 
Don't forget to sign up for the newsletter there. It goes out every Friday at 5 o'clock. It's free, good information. Thanks for listening. We'll be back next week right here on the Smart Investing Show. So amusing to think that I did all that. And may I say, 